Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nancy Hanks Lecture on Arts and Public Policy, featuring Vijay Gupta and introduced by the Honorable Nancy Pelosi. Please welcome to the screen the AFTA CEO, Robert Lynch. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Bob Lynch, President and CEO of Americans for the Arts, and I want to welcome uh, all of you to our very first first ever virtual presentation of the annual uh, Nancy Hanks Lecture on Arts and Public Policy. And while I certainly would have preferred to welcome you all in person to the grand halls of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts here in Washington, DC, uh, it's more important that we all stay safe at home during this unprecedented uh, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, although I have had the pleasure of seeing many of you, maybe more more than usually on our Zoom meetings throughout this crisis. Now uh, in its 33rd year, the Nancy Hanks Lecture on Arts and Public Policy is one of our premier public events. Uh, and this year is no exception. In fact, we are also presenting this lecture as the opening keynote of our 2020 Americans for the Arts Annual Convention and Public Art and Civic Design Conference. And, uh, and what a treat to have as our speaker, such a brilliant young artist as Vijay Gupta, who I am lucky enough to count as an inspiration, uh, a messenger of hope for our future, and a dear friend. One of the upsides of going virtual this year is that thousands more uh, arts enthusiasts, like all of you, are able to participate uh, in these wonderful events, all from front row seats. Um, over over 2,000 people involved overall with our conference and this lecture. Um, we are so grateful to have you with us, whether it's just for this Nancy Hanks lecture or whether you are staying on to participate in the rest of our three-day conference, uh, which features compelling sessions and performances and even networking opportunities. I congratulate you, each of you here in our, our gathering of arts leaders and managers and advocates uh, local arts champions for your resiliency and your creativity uh, in these turbulent times. You continue to amaze me, stories that I see uh, of folks all across the country, uh, with what you do. You are a significant part of the solutions for our country, and I, I thank you for that. Uh, before we begin today's program, I want to take a moment to extend our deep gratitude to the very generous sponsors whose support has made the 2020 Americans for the Arts Annual Convention um, possible, and uh, also the Public Art and uh, Civic Design Conference um, uh, as well. I, I first want to express our appreciation to the major supporters of the 33rd Annual Nancy Hanks Lecture. Special thanks go to Jamie Rosenthal Wolf, Rick Rosenthal, and Nancy Stevens of the Rosenthal Family Foundation. Um, as well as to the entire team at Brownstein, Hyatt, Faber, Shrek, who have helped us enormously with uh, all of our public policy work. Your generosity has made it possible for all of us to take part in what will be a very, very special experience today. I also want to thank our convention sponsors, uh, uh, American Express, the Morris and Gwendolyn Kayfords Foundation, the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, the Max and Victoria Dreyfus Foundation, uh, RBC Wealth Management, and Dorothy Pierce McSweeney. Your contributions made this virtual convening a reality. Thank you. Uh, it is important to take a moment to fully acknowledge that we are holding these events uh, at a time of significant upheaval and transformation in our country. As the contours of the coronavirus pandemic and its devastating impact on the creative economy wreak havoc on our lives and businesses, the larger issues of social justice and racial inequities and the abusive treatment of black, indigenous, and other populations of color have demanded that we all actively listen, reflect, and take action. We must unite to stop perpetuated systems of oppression and racism and inequality. We must support the Black Lives Matter movement and please know that many of these societal issues will be addressed by our keynote presenters and other presenters throughout the conference, 
including today's Nancy Hanks lecturer, Vijay Gupta. Now, Vijay is not only a brilliant musician and a soulful thinker and an altruistic and highly effective community activist, he's also the youngest member of the Americans for the Arts Board of Directors. Uh, but if you read his bio, you saw that he's always the youngest at everything that he does, and he brings that youthful energy and hope for the future to all of his good work. And the stars for this lecture were aligned when the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, enthusiastically agreed to provide today's opening remarks to both set the stage and to introduce you to the words and music of Vijay Gupta. Speaker Pelosi embodies the intellect, the grace, the empathy, and the toughness of true leadership. And it is a um, not an understatement to say she is a national treasure. Plus, she loves the arts, which is fabulous. So now, please welcome one of the great leaders and legislators that our country has known, the nation's <clears throat> most powerful woman, and the arts community's and this is true, top frontline negotiator who has secured billions of dollars of economic relief opportunities, uh, as well as regular arts funding opportunities, but for nonprofit arts organizations and gig artists. Ladies and gentlemen, the most honorable Nancy Pelosi. Good morning. It is an honor and indeed a pleasure to send warm greetings to the incredible artists and advocates at the Americans for the Arts 33rd Nancy Hanks Lecture. Thank you, Bob Lynch, for your visionary leadership at the Americans for the Arts. You're the best. For 60 years, Americans for the Arts has been a powerful voice for the arts community on Capitol Hill, ensuring that America's leaders recognize the immense value that the arts bring to our nation. As Americans, support for the arts is in our DNA. The arts have always been integral to our national dialogue and identity. As President Kennedy said, the life of the arts, far from being an interruption, a distraction in the life of the nation, is close to the center of a nation's purpose. As our nation confronts this challenging time, we look to the artistic community to bring us together and help us imagine a brighter future. But the arts community has been hit especially hard by the staggering impact of the coronavirus with millions of jobs lost and billions of dollars in revenue lost. The arts are not only an essential part of our society, but a critical strength of our economy, both locally and nationally. We must continue to fight for the emergency relief needed now, as well as for long-term funding needed to continue your important work. Because a failure to invest in the arts is a failure to invest in America's future. Despite these challenges, we are so inspired by all the artists who have embraced new media to share their work while social distancing, using their talents to entertain, comfort, and lift up our communities. Today's Nancy Hanks lecturer understands all too well the power of the arts to bring us together. As an acclaimed violinist, MacArthur genius, and champion for the arts, Vijay Gupta has already made a powerful impact on the artistic community at a very young age. After joining the LA Philharmonic as its youngest violinist ever, Mr. Gupta used his passion for music to confront the epidemics of homelessness, addiction, and incarceration through his Street Symphony Initiative. By bringing the power of music to these vulnerable communities, Street Symphony gives them the tools to express their pain as well as their dreams and the courage to transform their lives. As our nation thinks about recovering from the current crisis, Mr. Gupta's community-based initiative is a model for how the arts can help heal and unify our communities in a way that honors our bedrock values of equality and justice for all. We're all grateful for Mr. Gupta's tireless work and I know his timely and important message will inspire and motivate you all.
The words of the poem, When the Violin, were written in the 14th century by the Persian Sufi mystic Khwaja Shamsuddin Muhammad Hafez e Shirazi, commonly known in the West as Hafiz. Yet 700 years later, the American experiment and forgiveness don't really seem to be getting along. How can we forgive the dream of our nation built on genocide, built by stolen people on stolen land? How can we forgive eight minutes and 46 seconds? A knee crushing the life breath from George Floyd as he cried out for his mother. How can we forgive the wounds of the past as they continue to bleed into the present? Yet indigenous cultures teach us in the practices of restorative and transformative justice that forgiveness does not mean forgetting. Forgiveness is the impossible, audacious choice to take our identity from more than what was done to us or what we did to others. Forgiveness is the end of letting pain be the only author of our story. Artists understand forgiveness because we understand failure. We understand that we will always be humbled by the crafts which seem to have chosen us. Writers, weavers, painters, dancers, musicians, we, like some willing Prometheus, submit ourselves to a daily practice of failure. We fail so that we can fail better. We forgive so that we can keep making. We make ourselves accountable to the possibility of expressing the unspoken beauty that lies within us. Forgiveness is when the heart sings a new future into being. The work of the artist and the citizen is one to model, to practice in our smallest everyday actions the world we long to live in. With every breath, every brushstroke, every word, every note, we cast a vote for the future we want to create. We are called to create America. We are called to create the next response. We are called to this responsibility beyond our rage, beyond the need for things to change. We are called because of our innate ability to respond, the human and artistic abilities we have forged and which have forged us through the excruciating crucible of human experience. We are the metabolizers of grief and the witnesses of ecstatic joy we are curanderas and curators, tricksters and translators. Among us are those who dance the fandango at the frontera, who paint murals in prison, who make poetry from poison. We sing hallelujah in Skid Row. We are the mushrooms of our society, the ones who feed ourselves from compost, the ones who digest toxins and create nourishment from shit. In the face of all that is broken, we are the laborers of wholeness. Wholeness, like forgiveness, is a choice. Wholeness is the choice to listen to the symphonic score of our common body. The human body, the cultural body, the body politic, the body of our mother, earth. We listen with all our heart to the body which keeps the score. The author Parker Palmer teaches us that the work of wholeness is to create spaces between us where the soul feels safe enough to show up and make its claim on our lives. The next response is to show up and make of our broken American body still being born, a place safe enough for our souls to claim our lives. My first violin teacher had an apple orchard in the land of Muncie Lenape people in the mid Hudson Valley of New York where I grew up. 
At the end of each lesson, Mrs. Crist would lay out two baskets, one filled with candy, the other with shiny red apples. Because most of her students were four-year-old tykes like me, the apples usually went untouched. Mrs. Christ instructed us in something called the Suzuki method, developed by the famous Japanese pedagogue Shinichi Suzuki, who simply called his method talent education. Dr. Suzuki believed that miraculous talent was innate in every person. If a Japanese infant could learn to speak a language as difficult as Japanese, there was no reason why a child nurtured by love couldn't learn an instrument as difficult as the violin. His aim, though, was to teach more than music. It was to guide parents and teachers in cultivating the beautiful hearts of young people. I was raised by not one, but two Bengal tigers as parents. After just a year with Mrs. Christ, my parents took me to other Suzuki teachers across the Hudson Valley, eventually to New York City to study with a woman named Louise Barrent, who dedicated her life to teaching the Suzuki method. She was uncompromising. She sang and danced in her lessons. A few years ago, I realized that I teach my students exactly the way that Miss Barrent taught me. She took us six, seven, eight-year-olds, all the way to the stage of Carnegie Hall. There will always be a part of her that lives in me. As I moved beyond the 10 books of the Suzuki Method, my teachers became even more demanding than Miss Barrett. Practicing now became a Zen-like discipline. Slow was smooth and smooth was fast. Practicing each note, even the silent spaces between each note, like mindful microsurgery. But for a boisterous kid like me, slow was boring, and boring was an excuse to read novels and comic books while practicing. While woodshedding my Tchaikovsky concerto or Paganini caprices, I would escape into the stories of Hindu gods and Greek heroes. I read the entire chronicles of Narnia, Tom Sawyer, The Hobbit, and even the first two and a half Harry Potter books. Although The Prisoner of Azkaban did not entirely survive my mother's wrath, it became infinitely easier to read on a music stand in fragments. Of course, now I mostly practice off an iPad, and I think I read fewer novels and memorize less music than I did as a child. Another book which made it to my music stand was Farewell to Manzanar, the true story of a Japanese-American family living in Los Angeles in 1942. Following President Roosevelt's devastating Executive Order 9066, tens of thousands of Japanese-American families were forced into war relocation camps across the American West. They were fenced in by barbed wire, searchlights, and men with guns. Manzanar, in the Paiute land of the Owens Valley of California, in the visage of Mount Whitney and the Sierra Nevada, was an abandoned apple orchard. During their three-year incarceration, the residents of Manzanar did their best to cultivate some semblance of a normal life. The Nisei children went to school and played baseball. There was cheerleading and baton twirling. They even formed a dance band called the Jive Bombers, which would play any popular Glenn Miller tune, all except for the nation's number one hit at the time, Don't Fence Me In. Many of the Ise, the first generation immigrants, were masterful gardeners. They created parks and fountains and planted vegetable patches called freedom gardens. They made tile work and painted watercolors to impress their neighbors. They tended to the abandoned apple and pear trees. In 1943, a white tower was erected in the cemetery at Manzanar, inscribed with three flowing Japanese characters, i re to meaning soul-consoling tower. 
While the Issei and Nisei citizens waited out their wrongful incarceration, they cultivated the consolation of their souls. In their longing to be American, they did their best to create a place to belong. Tonight in Los Angeles, 66,000 people will be told that they do not belong. The epicenter of the crisis of homelessness in America today, Los Angeles County is only 8% African American, but black people make up a whopping third of the homeless population. As early as the 1960s, Skid Row, the 50 square block neighborhood of downtown LA, was the terminus of Greyhound therapy when an institution would buy a patient with a severe mental illness a one-way bus ticket to the City of Angels. Skid Row is often the end of the line for many who are consumed by intergenerational trauma manifested through chronic addiction and severe mental illness. But defining a neighborhood by its afflictions is a convenient excuse to erase it. Skid Row is precious land to developers and gentrifiers, especially in the light of the impending 2028 Olympics. But Skid Row could also be considered a recovery zone, one of the largest in the nation, a precious, vital place of new beginnings. In 2009, Americans for the Arts conducted a case study on the role of arts and culture in Skid Row part of the Animating Democracy program, the seminal study which gathered testimony from community members and leaders of neighborhood organizations was co-authored by Maria Rosario Jackson, then of the Urban Institute, and my mentor and friend, John Malpede, the founding director of Los Angeles Poverty Department, the first theater company to be made up primarily of unhoused people, and the first arts program of any kind for the homeless community of Los Angeles. Respondents of AFTA's study saw the power of art as being core to reclaiming their neighborhood, their cultural lineages, and their very lives, while also challenging a stigmatizing narrative. A community member stated, we are creating the recovery process a part of the wisdom that has been discovered and is operational in the neighborhood is that once you are given a safe space positive things happen we ostracize what we consider fragile and we criminalize what we call vulnerable we create the margin and then push people we call broken into that margin. We define people as problems to be solved and then erase them by locking them away. But the residents of Skid Row choose to define themselves by their art, by their cultures, and by the possibility of a life which matters. Since 1985, the Los Angeles Poverty Department, which calls themselves the good LAPD, has celebrated the art and cultures of Skid Row with projects like Walk the Talk, a parade commemorating neighborhood initiatives and the people behind them, an annual two-day festival of Skid Row artists, which has created a registry of over 800 artists working and living in Skid Row, and the Skid Row History Museum and Archive, a gallery space for Skid Row artists, and a center for challenging generative conversations with community activists and policymakers across the city to create a vision for a healthy, vibrant Skid Row. Skid Row is an artistic ecosystem composed of the painters of Studio 526, the tile mosaic makers of Piece by Piece, the singers of Urban Voices Project, and the musicians of Street Symphony, just to name a few. The work of Street Symphony is to create a relational laboratory through music. The music we offer is just the beginning of a dialogue, the beginning of a relationship. 
Whether we're playing jazz or Schumann at a county jail, singing the hallelujahs of Handel or Leonard Cohen at the Midnight Mission, or playing the music of mariachi, reggae, and West African traditions on the very streets of Skid Row, the music we play is a conduit of relationship, a way to listen to the voices and experiences of a community. In Skid Row, we were taught that listening is one sure act of love. Often we who get to leave Skid Row and return to our homes are the ones leaving with the greater gift. Today, Skid Row serves as a point of re-entry for thousands of Californians emerging from incarceration in the state's 35 prisons and from the billion dollar Los Angeles County Jail, which is effectively the planet's largest psychiatric facility. In 2018, Street Symphony started a program called Music for Change, supported by the California Arts Council's Reentry Through the Arts program, which empowers our musicians to engage individuals paroled from life sentences in prison. It was through this program that we met a musician named Dwayne Robert Garcia, a participant of programs at the Weingart Center in Skid Row. In his youth, Dee was a radio DJ in his home state of Hawaii and across the Western US before his deployment as a Marine to Vietnam, Okinawa, and Guam. Our first encounter with Dee was at Street Symphony's fourth annual Messiah Project, a sing-along of Handel's oratorio Messiah, featuring solo performances and new works created by and for the Skid Row community. Our performance was running quite a bit longer than expected, but D, sitting in the second row, sitting in his first public concert appearance after an incarceration lasting 30 years and 44 days was shushing ANSI social workers, telling them to be patient and enjoy the music. At the next year's Messiah Project, D was one of our opening acts, sharing his voice and his story with the people he came to call his new family. Each week now, even through COVID, D speaks and sings to us through his phone or Chromebook like some grand priest of music, a constant reminder of the transcendent power of love and music. Ladies and gentlemen, my heart bursts with pride to introduce you to my beloved friend and mentor, my colleague, a true American for his art, Dwayne Robert Garcia. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dee Garcia. I'm a musician and an artist in the Los Angeles area. I thank you for letting me be with you this day, and I'd like to share with you my thoughts on music as perfect love. I found in my life that words that the spirit longs to express are many times quickened to life in melodic forms that we lovingly call music. Single notes, triplets, and arpeggios strung together like a precious pearl necklace adorn the listener's heart and soul. Music stands in the gap even when the human embrace does not suffice a first responder, if you will, to the longing of the spirit at the very core of who we are. Our divinity drinks from the fountains of sound, ever refreshing the drought that at times can be a desert of space and time. Music, second to none, stands alone, the go-to place accessible to all of us, knocking at the doors of our being, crying out from the rooftops and on the highways and byways of all of our life's experiences always eager to please, ever pleasant, kind and loving, soothing the troubled waters of our sojourn, onward and upward, lilting and lifting us to crescendo, resolving in the rapture of auditory bliss. I find music is not necessarily about the gift, but it's about the giver, ever giving glory to the creator. Music loving in its, its expression Music solely gives to all, asking only that we share the unveiling of itself with each other. Music lends grace to the hearers. Music is purity. 
music is perfect love. Down the beach, Dolores in Jerusalem. Soul through sides of Pinero Street. But the crowd pressed in to see the man condemned to die on Calvary. For la vida, Dolores, Lisevia, Los soldados le abrían paso a Jesús. Mas la gente se acercaba para ver a quien llevaba que a Jesús. Por la vida dolorosa que salía del dolor, como oveja vino Cristo del Señor. Y fue Él quien quiso ir. Por su amor, por ti, por ti, por la vida dolorosa al Calvario y a morir. The blood that would cleanse souls of all men made its way through the heart of Jerusalem. Down the knee, so let us up all the way of suffering. Like a lamb came the Messiah, Christ the King. But he chose to walk at all out of his land for you and me. Down the knee, so let us up all the way to Calvary. Thank you very much. Dee was far too humble to tell you this, but all the incredible visual art you saw on the wall behind him was created by him during his incarceration. At the end of March, I watched the video of a man named Anthony Almojera, a 17-year veteran EMT and lieutenant of the New York City Fire Department. He spoke of the imminent wave of post-traumatic stress in first responders because of their inability, due to physical distancing requirements, to complete the first response. On top of the horrifying scale of human loss, due to the coronavirus, responders are unable to comfort the grieving with the first touch or embrace. In the face of loss, the human touch is as necessary for the responder, as necessary for the healer, as it is for the bereaved. Less than a month after Mr. Almojera's interview, a 23-year-old EMT named John Mondello the son of a retired NYPD officer took his own life with his father's gun. He had been on the force for three months. Like the thread which unravels the tapestry of all grief, the pandemic of COVID and the deeper pandemic of racism have laid bare a fundamental brokenness. As artists, we wake up empty and frightened knowing that producing some quick virtual commodity of art is not the same as processing our collective grief through our craft. We know that empty statements of solidarity and diversity are not enough to undo structures of white supremacy. And even as we are gaslighted into a new normal, we know that binge consuming entertainment through an algorithm is not the same as recovering the creative economy of our souls. We can't 
consume our way back into wholeness. How might we, Americans for the arts, stand in the gap of what is broken? How might we, like the gardeners of Manzanar, create a soul-consoling beauty? How might we, like those who march and sing in Skid Row, create spaces where our soul feels safe enough to claim this American life and sing out our next responses together? Another ancient voice from the Sufi world, that of Jalal al-Uddin Rumi, teaches us today like every other day, we wake up empty and frightened. Don't open the door to the study and begin reading. Take down a musical instrument. Let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. As we rebuild the nation for which we stand, the artists of America must first kneel and kiss the ground. We must let the beauty we love, the art we love, the nation we love become what we do. We must become America the beautiful. We practice the modest, unapplauded integrity between notes and brush strokes. We practice the relationships between us and our colleagues. We practice listening. We practice new conversations of accountability between our funders and our communities. We practice standing in the gap across the atavistic fear and sadness and pain, which keeps us disconnected from each other, which keeps us disconnected from ourselves. As artists have always done, we practice change. We practice evolution. We practice a human policy of connection. It is time to make our garden grow.
Awesome. Vijay Gupta. I uh, I thank you, Vijay. Um, amazing. I I thank you for the inspiring lecture and the moving, so moving performances. You know, at the very beginning, the piece uh, when the violin, uh, and then your words, um, that unspoken beauty that lies within us, is a a great reference to the to the music that you shared with us uh, today. A video recording of this event along with a written transcript of Vijay's lecture, uh, which is entitled The Next Response, Practicing the Future Now, will be available on the Americans for the Arts website and uh, our, YouTube uh, our YouTube channel in the coming days. I also wanna thank, once again, speaker Nancy Pelosi for not only her arts leadership on, on Capitol Hill, but also for her indispensable uh, national steward stewardship of our nation during these trying times. Um, and then for those of you who are staying on for the rest of today's annual convention, we have more phenomenal content in store for you. Starting in just a few minutes at 1245 Eastern time, you can join VJ for a live conversation and a Q&A breakout session. Then later this afternoon at 3.30 Eastern time, we welcome six mini keynotes, which we're calling COVID Talks, and they're featuring key leaders in our field. COVID Talks include uh, Kaywin Feldman, the head of the National Gallery of Art, uh, Helen Shaw, culture critic for the New York Magazine, and Angelique Power, president and CEO of the Field Foundation. For those of you uh, who are only joining us for the Hanks Lecture, and some of you have asked about this, I wanna thank you but also encourage you to consider registering for the entire convention to experience more great content from Americans for the Arts over the next three days. Our annual convention is an opportunity to get both inspiring speeches and presentations and crucial hands-on training from some of the top leaders uh, in our field. Um, but you can register for one, two, or all three days of the conference for as little as $100. So visit convention.artsusa.org to learn more. convention.artsusa.org to learn more. Please be on the lookout for a very short evaluation survey to share feedback on this first time virtual Hanks lecture experience. And we certainly hope that you enjoyed it. And thanks again to our sponsors and all of you for being a part of today's uh, 33rd annual Nancy Hanks lecture on the arts and public policy and to our speaker, Vijay Gupta. Enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of the conference for those of you who are staying on and please stay safe. Thank you.